Well, welcome everyone to the Leicester Prizes Behind the Canvas Artists in Conversation series. My name is Yvette Kenney Gibson and I'm the Marketing Communications and Media Manager for the Leicester Prize. Before we get started, on behalf of the Leicester Prize, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where we live, learn and work. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging. I'd like to introduce our three 2020 finalists who will be chatting to us in this Behind the Canvas Artists in Conversation session today. Kira Faulkner Babel, Jan Carney, and Lauren Snowden. Kira is a painter living, studying, and practicing in Melbourne. In 2016, she was awarded third prize in the Leicester Prize Youth Awards. She's consistently participated in the Sydney Road Window Gallery's Art on the Spot, a community painting demonstration in Melbourne. Welcome, Kira. Hi. Jen Carney is an internationally recognised award-winning realist artist based in Geelong. She's been a finalist in over 80 prestigious international and national art prizes and exhibited in Italy, Spain, the United States of America and the UK. Jen has been selected as a finalist in the BP Portrait Prize of 2017 at the National Portrait Gallery in London. She won the prestigious FWSD Fashion Week San Diego ARC Award in 2018, an international travelling exhibition uh, in Los Angeles, New York, and uh, San Diego and Barcelona. She was most recently announced as winner of the 2020 Lethbridge 2000. Welcome, Jan. Hi. And finally, Lauren Snowden. Lauren is an emerging artist who completed a BFA honours at RMIT Melbourne. She uses a variety of mediums to communicate post-colonial concepts in relation to her personal and familial history focused on breaking down barriers that exist due to visual differences, Snowden experiments with discarded materials using haptic play to change the form and function of substances. These actions serve to present the familiar in unexpected ways to represent the other and bridge cultural divides. By using traditional art practices such as painting and sculpture, Snowden endeavors to unite perspectives and validate lived experience. Welcome Lauren. Thanks. Bye. So first of all, what we'd like to do is just um, open up with a couple of um, questions. First of all, uh, Kira, perhaps you can um, give us a bit of an insight as to where you're actually talking to us from today. Are you at home or at work or in your studio? Um, at the moment, I'm in my studio, which also happens to be my bedroom. You can sort of see the clutter of like home stuff and art supplies in my background. That's great. And Jan, whereabouts are you speaking to us from today? Uh, my home studio, which I'm very fortunate to have. Just have to walk out the back door and I have a, a lovely, totally renovated old stable that's uh, been turned into my studio. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And Lauren? I'm actually in my living room, which generally functions as my studio. <laughs> Except um, I'm actually hoping to get a studio built up myself uh, starting next week. So oh, that sounds exciting. I'll be in my own studio and not in the family living room. <laughs> yeah. And is that something like, just looking to, Kira, obviously you're an emerging artist um, starting out. So... Jan and Lauren, um, perhaps you can give us a bit of insight um, and how you started too. Is it a similar sort of experience to, to Kira sort of starting off in your bedroom and, and just being really passionate about art through school? Uh, for me, not, not at all. <laughs> I didn't start painting uh, until I was in my 40s. So I didn't start in my bedroom. <laughs> um, and I was fortunate enough that... Uh, I had a husband that's very handy and um, he said, okay, well, let's get this art thing going for you. And um, he restored the stable for me. And um, so I went straight into my own studio. Very lucky. And I actually wanted to study fine art at uni after I left school and ended up nursing because that was the thing you did, have a career that, supported your artistic um, endeavours and only actually started painting 
probably 14 years ago, I started um, trying my hand at painting and decided I had to complete what I planned to do when I finished school, which was go to uni and study art. And I'm really glad I did that. It's definitely where my calling is. Oh, that's wonderful. So, Kira, there you go. You're sort of you're in a quite a unique situation where you've sort of studied from a young age, and sort of gone straight into it. Are you are you also finding you're having to supplement your art practice with other things in terms of work? Um, I'm actually three years out of high school at the moment. I had a bit of a break before I went straight into um, arts. I think everyone has that thing where they're like, I can't commit to this. This is crazy, you know, but. I came back around in the end. I have had some part-time jobs and stuff because, you know, you gotta. <laughs> but as much as I can, I spend my time and my paychecks on art supplies and making paintings and things. <laughs> Living at home helps though. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure um, Lauren and Jan would say the same. I think support from family in whatever form that takes is a big part of an artist's life. I think it's a little bit different too now for uh, the younger generation. It, it seems to be more acceptable for them to go straight into art from school. I don't know if it, if it was the same for, for Lauren, but our gener generation, I'm probably a generation above um, Lauren as well, it was not really the norm or an accepted course of you know, work to go into, especially for women. It wasn't for me as well when I was finishing up, but I don't think I would have had the courage to go into art to cover what I have been unpacking since I started studying. So I've been aware that there's been a lot of deep uh, concepts that I've needed to work out and have the life experience for before I could actually address them. So I don't think I was ready to actually unpack that until I was more mature. So I, I sometimes wonder if art school would have been wasted on me if I'd started straight out of school. Yeah, I, I've wondered that about myself as well. And um, I, I never went to art school and I still haven't been to art school and have no um, formal art training. Um, I, I did go to a community college. It was like a one or two year course. And I lasted about three months there and thought, oh, I can't stand this. This is not for me. I, I don't want to do those things they're asking me to do. I had uh, specific things in mind that I wanted to do. And I thought that I'd be able to go to school and say, this is what I want to do. And I want you to teach me how to do it. And it, it just wasn't like that at all. So um, I don't think art school would have suited me anyway at any time so but I, I know that's that's it not everyone's like that and get a lot out of school and I'm sure both of you have and still do a big part of it for me is I really want to build up a network of other artists I guess that was the thing I was most excited about going to uni and next year I'm really I'm really keen <laughs> yeah I'm on the opposite I think you know, I, I, I didn't want to be influenced by anybody else. Uh, and uh, and I've done some short courses and a weekend workshop here and there and that sort of thing. And even that, I could feel myself um, being influenced by the person training or the teacher or the tutor there. And um, a few times I've had to pull back and go, stop painting like them learn to paint like you and that took me a long time to to learn that too and I I think had I I'm um, the kind of person had I gone to school um, that I would have been too influenced maybe by my tutors. I used to have that fear as well and I had to push past that I found when I started uni I was scared of not finding my own voice or my own style in, in my art practice, but um, I'm glad I did get past that because I realized that those influences actually helped to inform my practice um, in the end. So yeah, like you said, it's sort of different courses for different roles. I mean, you know, there's a different way of doing it and that's worked for you obviously. And yeah. 
Yeah, it's absolutely a different journey for everybody and, and to find your own style and signature. Um, I think that's, for me, was probably one of the hardest parts. And, and even at, at points in my career, I've, I haven't even thought I've had my own style and, um, until somebody points it out to you and then you think, okay, yeah, I do have a style. I do have um, something that's a little bit different to everybody else. Um, but I couldn't even recognise it for, for quite a while. So I don't know whether school helps, helps you to discover that. I don't know. Um, how did you find that, Kira? I've had very limited experience with art school so far, but I've always been incredibly headstrong. I've never really worried about, I've been honestly a bit nervous about not taking in enough um, experience from people that know more about me. I'm like, I should be listening to these people. They, will, they know what they're talking about, but I do find myself, I'm like, no, pink is better. I'm gonna use pink as the, you know, in their eyeballs or whatever. Like I, I struggle with that a little bit. <laughs> um, I think it's good though. It's it's just, you know, I I like taking in as many sources of inspiration and and um like um like people trying to help you as possible. I feel like as many people trying to help you along the road is <laughs> I'll never say no to that. That's a good point That's because I think part of the journey yeah. is having um those suggestions put forward to you so you can actually listen and dismiss. So that's mm. part of knowing your boundaries as well. And so in terms then of the three of you, it's quite interesting because you're sort of coming at it from um, sort of a different perspective, but there's obviously quite a bit of um, what were the, the, the things that perhaps drove you, what inspired you um, to go into art in the first place? Kira, obviously you're, you're the youngest <laughs> but what was it about art that really spoke to you? Um, part of me, part of it was, I don't think anyone could stop me. It was a little bit like a freight train. They're like, why are you, why are you going in this direction? I was like, art stuff. But a lot of it as well was my family was super supportive and that's sort of what I addressed in the painting that I submitted for the Lesser Prize. If it, was, if it hadn't been for my amazing supportive family and all the art that I was surrounded with growing up, I might not have developed it's this particular bloodlust for the visual image um it was definitely I've always been exposed to a lot of art and I did have in high school I had this thing where I was sort of I could apply myself to anything and be good at it so I was good at maths and I was good at science and I was good at English and every teacher was like do this subject for the rest of your life this is the one for you and it took me a while reflecting I was like why did I even choose art I could have done anything else you know but mm. I was just like I love this. It makes me so happy. You know, maths doesn't make me particularly happy. I could just sort of do it, but doing a painting makes me so really thrilled. <laughs> and we've just got up on screen now um, the slide of your your piece, Race Car Yaya. And so, Kira, perhaps you could sort of talk to, to us a little bit about the this particular work and your subject and sitter. So my subject in Sitter is my grandparents, Robin and Carl Babble. Um, uh, I, they were a really big part of my life growing up and they, they're very, I've always described their house as a bit of like a cabinet of curiosities and my friends would come over and they'd be like, what is this Kira, you live in a museum? And I was like, no, they just have lots of crazy things and they always loved, you know, their sort of vintage collectibles and my grandmother had had at one point over almost 2000 books. They were very, you know, into media. And the title of this artwork is a reference to the president of the United States song. Like they always brought like music and literature and books. They were really, you know, they very much encouraged me to take an interest in this kind of stuff. And I sort of wanted to say thank you to them for the support and the way they've helped shape my life they're also moving they've always been very close like they've always lived very close to me but they've moved about like two hours away now it's a bit of a drive and I don't have a license so you know it's even further away um so I wanted to give them something that they could take with them to their new home to say you know thank you and I love you <laughs> oh it's beautiful 
It's such a great piece. The, the pieces in the background, uh, the, that's what I grew up with. So I, I totally can recognise a lot of the ornament in the, in the work. I just, I love it. I love the colour in it too. It's a fantastic piece. Thank it you. It's a beautiful piece. The colouring, that pink, the way it's, um, it's almost fluorescent, I suppose, when, when looking at it, the way the wall and the pink is actually influencing the subjects. It's, it's got a beautiful warm wash over it. And listening to you talking about the painting and the influence your grandparents had on you, really comes through. I think you've captured a, yeah, almost like a bygone era in a sense, but a memory um, in that painting. It expresses the quirky nature of them too, I think, as well. It's, uh, it's really charming. <laughs> and then Jan, just looking at your, um, your work here for your entry for this year, Road to Nowhere, and perhaps you could talk us through about what inspired you to create this piece. Um, Tia is the, the model in the work. I've done quite a lot of paintings using her. Um, she's just such a wonderful model to work with. Um, she, she just gets where we're going with the piece at, from the start. And um, even though it's, it's quite staged, there's always a lot of meaning in the work that I do, or a lot of narration, I suppose. And um, the the narrative behind the work, it's it's fairly obvious. You know, she's on a bus in her life, and she feels like she's going nowhere. Um, and a lot of the graffiti on the bus, some of the wording reflects that. Um, I always put my signature on the graffiti as well. So it's in there somewhere. Oh, and a lot, of, a lot of people that um, have meaning in my life too, I put in the graffiti in the background. Um, yeah, so it was just um, a series that I've been working on called Dystopia is the, is the series. And it's just sort of really um, showing how difficult it can be for young people to express their creativity and, and fit in and feel like they fit in and connect in society today. Um, and in the background behind me, this is a, a partner piece that I've been working on this year during lockdown. It's um, a partner piece to the one there. Um, and this also has a lot of meaningful things in it, um, personal to me, about my experience this year with COVID. Um, we have the mask, of course, that's been discarded. Uh, um, and once again, within the, the bus, the graffiti is people that have had meaning to me this year. Um, it's been an extremely difficult year for us. My husband's um, been diagnosed with terminal cancer, which is not something that you want to go through during COVID at the best or worst of times. Um, and so it's just been an extremely emotional and difficult year. So this painting's called Terminal. Um, and so that's, that's a sort of series that I've been working on. This is the only painting that I've actually painted this year. The time out in the studio has been really hard to find um, because Families come first this year. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so everything in my work has some kind of meaning to me or story. So. And did you find the painting process for this particular piece um, for the Leicester Prize this year, Jan? Did you did you find um, the the process of of creating the portrait was that something that was fast and immediate or long and slow or how did you? Uh, Obviously, your time in the studio was quite limited because, obviously, of these really um, important family commitments that you had with your husband. But did you did you find that the time when you were actually in the studio to create the work did, did it sort of tend to um, happen quite quickly, or or was it quite a long process for you? My paintings always take a long time. Um, just from concept right through to the end. So I'll have the concept in mind and 
I had found the box and thought, great, amazing. So by the time I find the area or the subject, um, gather the model, get out there, take photos, there, there goes one day on its own just with the photo shoot. Um, and I'll take hundreds and hundreds of images, sometimes more than a 1,000, um, and then I'll come home and go through those, and that'll take me probably two weeks to sift through and try and find which image I would like to work with. And even doing that, often I'll have a part of the model. So, for instance, in the one that um, is in the Leicester, I really liked the position of the model, but I didn't like the position of her head. Um, but I found in one of the other photos, uh, I had a great position for the face and head. So then, you know, I'll have to do some massive photoshopping and, um, you know, put a new head on or put a new foot on or something that just doesn't quite fit that needs to be tweaked, um, ready for my reference photo. Um, so, you know, I can spend three or four weeks just getting that how I want it, then come into the studio and then spend probably another uh, four to eight weeks painting it. So, yeah, it can be quite a lengthy process depending on the work. And so, um, Lauren, um, it would be great for you to just give us a bit of insight into your subject and still a sitter, Percy Paul. So Percy was my father and he passed away in 2018 and he, he had a stroke and basically passed away within a three month period. And I happened to have had a year off in 2018 from, from studying and was able to spend every day with him along with one of my siblings and my mum, we took it in turns uh, and another sibling to be with him and care for him and he was able to come home. And I think we got to really, um, when you're working with someone who uh, is falling, has fallen ill, you, I think, get to really celebrate a lot of how they have influenced your life my father was a very quiet person, but he promoted all of us. He encouraged all of us to be the most that we could be. And it was really important for me to make my father seen. I wanted him acknowledged for the influence that he had in my life and my children's lives. And in his whole wider family's life, he's uh, just been quite an admirable person to know. But it was, he, he hates the spotlight. So he'd never have agreed to have, um, you know, had his pet portrait put into the Leicester Prize, except for the fact that it promoted me. So there's a bit of a catch, I suppose, in, in the way that um, he worked. But it was only a few years ago that I found out that my father's parents were actually, had been born in India. And because of, racial complications and uh, the lack of privilege or position that they would have had in Sri Lanka if, if that had been identified at the time that my father was growing up. He was, he was born in Sri Lanka, but he always identified as Sinhalese, which made a difference to his employment. And it was significant to me to have lived most of my life and not know what my heritage was. In, on my father's side. So it, it just spoke into post-colonialism. It spoke into a lot of different uh, things about identity that I've had to unpack, uh, which yeah, it just all seemed to tie into one, uh, into one um, big picture that uh, it, it, it was, put, it poured out of me. It just had to be, had to be made into a composition and he had to be seen. So I, I think the painting really drove itself. So gorgeous. It's lovely. It's, it's really intriguing. Uh, I love the use of colour as well, and the limited use of colour, but with the 
complementaries in the background. It's um, quite striking. Thank you. That was, yeah, it's, it was, uh, I feel like I extended, I, I moved in the way I normally paint. Uh, it was important to have a large sweep of that particular red paint in the background, which was, I think, significant to verandas that um, I used to see, or that I've got in my memory of um, colonial homes around Sri Lanka. And I was exposed to a lot of those elements. There's the backgrounds taken from memories of a garden that I used to play in when I was a child. And the room at the back that my father's sitting in as an old man, just prior to him um, passing away, is a room that uh, from a house that my parents used to live in. So, and the chair he's standing next to is a chair that he's, that I've drawn from a picture that was quite difficult to actually, a photograph that was difficult to interpret, but his grandmother, his mother, my grandmother when she was 16 was standing next to a image um, of a chair similar to that uh, in a French convent. So, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of meaning to. I did oh. wonder about the chair and I wondered if the chair, um, there was somebody significant missing or if it was your chair for you to sit beside him and you couldn't be. And so, yeah, it's interesting to hear the story behind the chair. Yeah, I think it's to do with the fact that I'd found out about my grandparents' birth country so late. I always thought they'd been, they were born in Sri Lanka. Uh, their history wasn't spoken about by my father. Whereas my mother, on the other hand, spoke, always spoke about her history and her uh, family, um, our heritage. But on my father's side, it was very much hidden. No, it felt hidden. Mm. Was there a reason for that, that he did that? Uh, well, I think, again, because for opportunity, when, when my grandparents uh, moved across from India to Sri Lanka, and for, but it wasn't for their opportunity because my grandfather was actually quite a, had a prominent role in the police in Sri Lanka. He was a bandmaster, and that doesn't sound like much in today's terms, but back then it was quite a prestigious position to hold. And I grew up knowing that he was a bandmaster and a, an amazing musician, but not knowing about their history. And for my father and his siblings to make a go of it in Sri Lanka, for instance, uh, they, they had to hide their, they couldn't really celebrate their ancestry. So it's, I think it was stifling. I think it was quite limiting to passing on a sense of pride or identity and belonging for myself. And I think that's something that I uncovered in raising my own children, that there was a sharpness, there was a stifling um, to the experience of being able to pass on that heritage to them. That's probably a really great segue to, to speak to Kira about her um, grandparents. Kira, um, can you give us a bit more sort of background information as to where your grandparents came from and um, and how that inspired your work? Um, <laughs> I don't know very much about their heritage. At the very least, it wasn't very important to them. I know my grandfather was Jehovah's Witness, but he excommunicated to marry my grandmother. And so he was always sort of distant from his family. And then my grandmother's family was in Adelaide and we didn't see them as much either and they were all a little bit distant. It always felt a little bit more like a little closed community with us and them. Um, and so you've obviously it, spent a lot of time with them growing up? Yeah. Um, I guess I can talk about their like lives that I <laughs> am aware of. Absolutely. I think one of the most interesting things and I think it's and did you, you go around and photograph them? Pardon? 
I think um, I, I was just wondering where did you get all the reference for the things in the background? Oh, um, it's all from their house. <laughs> so yeah. I went and took photos of all their possessions and I did like, like you did, I made a photo collage of all their items. So they weren't necessarily placed like this in their house, but they were all from their house. And they were all the ones that like were most memorable to me from when I was growing up in their house. So they weren't necessarily the most prominent possessions that they own, but they were the ones that I remembered most vividly growing up, especially um, these two little nude women in the top left corner. I remember as a little kid being like, movies, you know, I was quite fascinated by them. Um, as well as this pink wall, this wasn't actually, they've since moved out of the house that they lived in when I was growing up, but they had this really big pink feature wall in their, that, their original house and that always sung really brightly in my memory. Like whenever I think of them, I think of them in front of this pink wall because it just fits so perfectly with their personalities. Did you get them to dress like that or is that just how they would normally dress? Or did you think that would, oh, I've seen you in that shirt. Will you put that shirt on for this painting or was it just how they are? They do dress like that all the time, but I did go through their closets and I was like, can you guys pick out some outfits and then I'll choose the outfits that I like the best that complement each other. So I did, I was thinking about my color palette, but they, it was all their clothes. Yeah. He's always wearing um, Hawaiian shirts and he's got these hardware um, suspenders that he always wears. He works at Bunnings and that was the little anecdote that I wanted to add in. I feel like it's a fun thing that you can find in the painting that his finger has been, he cut it off so it's sort of like this and it looks like it might just be wrapped around but you can see on the shoulder that it's um, missing. <laughs> he cut it off himself because he was like I don't need to use the protective element and it was in front of my mum and she like she freaked out. <laughs> but, it's a yeah, I can imagine that would be very. <laughs> she would have been young, I suppose, at the time. Oh no! Um, my parents and my grandparents were both actually born. They had kids really young, so I think my, my grandparents were in their twenties, and then my parents were also in their twenties, and they had me. So, I think my mum, she's currently in her forties, um, and my grandparents are in their sixties, and I'm twenty. <laughs> wow. And so I suppose that it's quite interesting, isn't it, that as, as I'm listening to the three of you talk, that, that this um, connection with family is such a huge part of your work. Um, and as you were saying earlier, Lauren, in terms of pride and identity and belonging and how family connects us all with those things in our lives. I'd be interested to find out from the three of you um, in terms of, uh, what you're working on next with your um, with with your next works is is family also going to feature in those as well or or are you working on something new? I've got a campus that is waiting to get started on, and it's going to be a companion to my father, except this new canvas is my mother, <laughs> and I've got a composition. She's her, her um, background is European, as was my father's, but my father's was more Indian European, so, and I'm, I'm considered Eurasian. Eurasian. Mm -hmm. And my mum always spoke about her ancestry. So, and she she made me fall in love with Melbourne when we first came here. We would traipse around the city. She worked in the city, and we discovered all the laneways, all the streets. I know Melbourne backwards because of those expeditions. So my painting with my mum is going to be a far busier composition than how my dad's been painted. He's a very, you know, subdued and introverted character, whereas my mum's quite outgoing and socialised a lot and worked until she was in her 70s. She just loved that connection. Uh, so, yes, I can't wait to get started on that once COVID's, you know, really released us from this home and, <laughs> and we're able to, you know, get my studio started. I've, yeah, it's been mulling over in my mind. And Jan, what about you? Um, my time's been, as I said, really limited this year, even though we've been locked down. Um, 
I haven't had much time out in the studio because, as you say, family... Oh, we might have lost Jan just momentarily. Is more important than my family first. Um, um, and I, I did this piece, which was all about family, even though um, it's not my daughter in there. Um, a lot of the story and narrative in the graffiti is family based. Um, and so I feel like I need to put that away. That's been quite cathartic painting this piece. Um, and I need to focus on something um, a little brighter um, and a little less intense, I suppose. So I've started working on a piece um, for this series, which is the Eye Candy series. Um, and it's a fun series to work on because it's so bright and colourful. Um, but they come with messages as well. Um, this piece here has lots of... Uh, messages in the candy in the background and the, the next piece I'm working on too it has quite a feminist feel about it and I, I just feel um, even though I try not to sometimes I just can't keep my mouth shut and I always have to have something to say about something <laughs> political or um, you know defend the underdog and particularly uh, been working on a fair bit of uh, work towards feminism lately. And Kira, what about you? What, what, what have you got in the works? Well, I'm on uni break at the moment, so I'm mainly painting Christmas presents and I'm working on a few commissions. Um, I have a lot of friends that from, I did a film course, so I have lots of friends that are, are filmmakers um, and I'm working on a few um, posters for them and stuff. So that's cool. It's nice to make some money out of this thing that I love. Um, but then, yeah, next year I'm starting back first year in VCA. I'm really excited and I'm sort of going in blank slate. I don't have any ideas going in, but there'll be some good stuff coming out, hopefully. Oh, that's wonderful. Look, on, on, it's probably time for us to start wrapping up. The time has just flown. <laughs> but on behalf of the Lester Prize, I really wanted to thank Kira and Jan and Lauren. On behalf of everyone here at the Leicester Prize, I would like to thank our finalist artists for taking the time to join us for this episode of Behind the Canvas, Artists in Conversation. We're incredibly proud of your gifts and talents and all the wonderful work selected for this year's collection. They've been a source of great inspiration for our audiences here in Perth, as well as those watching on their screens in classrooms, studios, and homes across Australia. If you've been inspired to enter next year's prize, Please stay tuned for our call for entries, which will be launched in March, April 2021. We encourage you to visit our website, lesterprize.com, where you can view our virtual exhibition, listen to our podcast, purchase artworks, and order your copy of the 2020 Exhibition and Guided Art Practice Book. Head to the Leicester Prize YouTube channel to check out our art workshop and demonstration videos. Join the conversation on socials at Leicester Prize and subscribe to our newsletter through linktree forward slash Leicester Prize to stay up to date with all the latest happenings.